Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is that you Inky Savages are joining me for episode number 191 of the Penboy Roy Pentertainment Podcast. 191 episodes, can you believe it? So I'm here with you today. Somebody in one of the comments had said to me, maybe you should introduce yourself. Okay, so for those of you joining me for the first time and you don't know this podcast slash YouTube channel, my name is Roy a.k.a. Penboy Roy. I started off doing a lot of fountain pen reviews, and then I kind of decided, you know what, I want to dive into more, I guess, interactive stuff, communicating with people and talking to people, because I did enjoy reviewing fountain pens, but after a while, I wondered to myself, how many times can you review a Yovo Nib? And I felt like it was becoming redundant, and I think there's a format. There was a format that I was using, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to change things up because once you get the format, it's kind of a blueprint for you guys. You guys can review the pens yourself. You don't need me anymore. So I actually wanted to dive into more concepts of entertainment and whatnot. So here I am. I'm doing a podcast. I really do enjoy doing the podcast. Uh, as I said previously in previous episodes, our good friend, Mr. Odd Oink, Tom. He's gotten so much going on. He wasn't able to keep up with my constantly changing schedule. I mean, if you look at the time right now, it's late in the night. So normal people with priorities such as family, children, children's sports, jobs, they just can't keep up with me. So unfortunately, the Odd Oink is not going to be with us and it is sad. But at the same time, I think I can provide you guys with some content that you'll enjoy. The topic that I wanted to talk to you about today after the intro is fountain pen burnout. What the hell is fountain pen burnout? Well, you're just going to have to stick around and find out because I have some interesting things to talk to you about in regard to fountain pen burnout. Now, before we get started with that, I need to talk to you about poo. <laughs> we need the poo. Okay, so from our good friends over at Luxury Brands, Distributors of Benu, spelled B-E-N-U, Benu is introducing the Weenie the Pooh fountain pen inspired by the endearing teddy bear created by English author A.A. A. Milne, M-I-L-N-E. I, I, I might be butchering that name. I apologize for anybody who knows how to read. I never claim to be smart. And English illustrator E.H. Shepard. I think I got that one right. The pen is produced in a positive shade of turquoise blue and showcases the famous hand-painted yellow bear as it first appeared in Milne's original Winnie the Pooh book in 1926, aiming to delight anyone fond of this cheerful character from childhood. The pen is set to launch in the United States, retailing on June 15th, 2024. So it's around the corner. The MSRP of this fountain pen is $280. You can actually get a discount on these pens if you go to my affiliate link in the description below to my favorite retailer on the history of retailers and the greatest and best retailer in the history of anything ever created ever, Gold Spot Pens. Check out my affiliate link in the description below and make sure you use that affiliate link to purchase the Weenie the Pooh is it Winnie the Pooh? No, it's just Pooh. See, Winnie the Pooh is Disney's property, but Pooh is public domain. So since Banu is referencing the Pooh that is available in public domain and not Disney's Winnie the Pooh, they had to make illustrations true to the drawings from the book in 1926. So you don't get a balloon and you don't get a red shirt, but you do get a, a naked bear and get a piglet. A pi I think that piglet is available for at Gold Spot Pens. I'm confused by the read because it says, but you do get a piglet now. So does that mean the piglet is available now? But then it says June 15th launch date. I got to get clarification. But the description, I'm sorry, the link is in the description below. Make sure you click on that link and at checkout, use coupon code STEAMBOAT, S-T-E-A-M-B-O-A-T. All right. Wow. S coupon code STEAMBOAT for an additional discount on all the products on the Gold Spot websites. 
there are some exclusions that apply. So that discount code works for pretty much any product, but there are limitations. Like there are some brands that they don't allow the discounts. It is what it is. Can't do anything about that. But anyway, I, I really do like the color of this Pooh Bear pen and the piglet is cute. It's a nice swirly pen. You take a look at it. I'm going to have pictures up, so I think you guys will enjoy it. But anyway, I want to get onto the topic, what fountain pen burnout is all about, and get into the nitty-gritty of that. So before I get started, I just want to give you guys a quick disclaimer. This podcast is not scripted and therefore will contain potty mouth words. So be forewarned. You have been warned. Now, onto the podcast. The Pet Boy Roy Entertainment Podcast. Stage seven. Okay, so fountain pen burnout. There's many of you who are going to be hearing me say these words and you're going to be like, that's some bullshit. I'll never get fountain pen burnout. But I think that it is an actual phenomenon that happens to a lot of people. Maybe they don't know it. Me, I acknowledge it. I know it. And I'm going to talk to you about what that is. What is fountain pen burnout? Okay, so I looked up the definition of what burnout is, and the definition of what burnout is actually applies to our hobby in many ways, and I'm going to talk about that. But burnout is a psychological syndrome emerging as a prolonged response to chronic interpersonal stressors on the job, and that could be any job. The three key dimensions of this response are on are an overwhelming exhaustion, feelings of cynicism, and detachment from the job and a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. So that's a pretty thorough definition. That definition can apply to anybody across any field of work. It could be if you're a nurse, if you're a fireman, if you're military, if you're a police officer, if you're a professional fighter. So fountain pen burnout happens to us, I think. I think it happens to a lot of people within the hobby, and I think there's a lot of causes. So what are the causes of fountain pen burnout. So I'm going to list them out for you. I think, and this is not an all-inclusive list. These are the things that popped into my head. I think the expenses, I think the oversaturation of market, and then you got your grail pen. Now what? Time constraints, impractical use scenario, and mockery. Mockery. Hmm. What does that mean? I'll explain to you. Okay. But I want to start with expenses. So the causes of fountain pen burnout can be the fact that they are costly items. I mean, you don't have to always buy a fountain pen that costs a lot. For example, I have the Monteverde Mountains of the World. Now, in the fountain pen world, this Monteverde Mountains of the World fountain pen is not considered expensive. It's about $70 or $80 to the best of my knowledge. It has a Yovo stainless steel rose gold plated OmniFlex nib, cheapy plastic feed. It's made of acrylic. It's a cartridge converter pen, and here I got an extended, long, international cartridge. Now, it's $70, $80 in the fountain pen hobby, not really that much. Everybody would call that a lower price pen, right? And I always like Monteverde. I know that there's a lot of hit or miss with a lot of people out there, but for the most part, I feel like Monteverde and the Yaffa pens, Conklin, I think they do a decent job. But this pen here being $80 is cheap to us in the fountain pen world, but in the real world, people who rock ballpoint pens and free pens that you get at banks and pens that you get from Glock certifications, spending more than two bucks for a pen is almost unheard of, right? So normal non-fountain pen users, they're so used to using pens that they get at banks, ballpoint pens, crappy pens here. A lot of times you're signing a sign-in log at wherever you're going and there's a bunch of pens in a cup you use it and you put it down in the book after you sign it and you walk away from it the next person accidentally knocks it onto the floor and it's gone forever right so if you ask one of them hey this pen is only 70 80 dollars it's a cheap pen they're going to look at you like you're a little crazy and the truth is 70 80 dollars although considered and more inexpensive pen in the fountain pen industry is a lot of money in the real world, right? With $70, $80, you can get more than a tank of gas with a car that takes 93 octane, right? I have a, an NX300. I spend about $45 to $50 to fill that thing up. It lasts about a week. 
for 60 70 80 dollars you can buy a playstation 5 game for 70 80 dollars you can buy a whole slew of things and we've gotten to the point where 70 to 80 dollars for a fountain pen is not a grail pen status so we're more inclined to go out and just buy a fountain pen that we're curious about that we don't necessarily want but we see it and we're like oh that's that's interesting i'm gonna buy it and you drop 70 80 bucks like it's nothing everywhere else in your life if paper towels were 2.99 for a roll and next to it is two dollars for a roll you would go for the one for two dollars and like if you're like me you'll walk into a grocery store see the 2.99 paper towels, see that the one that's usually $2 is not there, and then say, you know what, I'm not buying paper towels today, I'll get it tomorrow when they restock, or I'll go to a CVS next door, whatever it is. $1 made the difference, rather 99 cents made the difference for me to decide not to buy something. Whereas a fountain pen being under $100, being around $70 or $80, I'll just spontaneously buy on a whim just because I want to, I want to try it. I'll Roll the dice on it. Not that expensive. It's a cheaper pen. But $70 to $80 is not synonymous with cheap. So what ends up happening is you accumulate a lot of these $70, $80 fountain pens. A lot of times you won't wait to buy your Grail pen because you're thinking, gee, I can't, I can't afford my $800 Grail pen or my $1,200 Grail pen, whether it's a, a Visconti Homo Sapien. Sapien? I'm an idiot. Sapien. Today I'm really being stupid. A lot going on. So a Homo Sapien for 850 bucks. I'm not going to drop 850 bucks for a pen today, so I might as well treat myself to something cheaper to hold me over, right? In reality, anybody who's logical won't buy the $70, $80 pen and just keep saving up until they can get their Grail pen. But Grail pen is something I also want to talk about that has to do with burnout, but I'm going to get to that later. Next, oversaturation of the market, Okay. Now, in the definition of burnout, we talked about a lack of sense of accomplishment and cynicism, right? So lack of sense of accomplishment, w where could that come from, right? I was thinking about this and that has a lot to do with having gotten your grail pen. So I think everybody on, on a fountain pen journey starts with a fountain pen that someone gives them, something that's only 20 bucks or less, something that's very cheap, and they get infected with the fountain pen virus. Then they ask what else is out there like I did, and then you start Googling. You jump into the rabbit hole. Now you're looking at pens that are 40 to $50. Now you're looking at pens that are 70 to $80. Now at this point in your fountain pen journey, that is a shitload of money, and you're thinking to yourself, wow, I'm gonna buy a 70 $80 fountain pen, which is cool, and then you know what, that's it. So you buy your $70, $80 fountain pen and then you go down the rabbit hole even more and you don't stop in that rabbit hole. Now you're like, wait a minute, there's gold nibs out there? So you start looking into gold nibs. Now you're thinking to yourself, wow, these, these are $180. And you're like, okay, but it is a gold nib. So it's justifiable, right? Because it's a precious metal. It's probably a better pen. Gold is different than steel. You start Googling. You got influencers like... Brian Goulet, SBRE Brown, Fig Boot on Pens with a billion reviews on gold nib pens and talking about how they're different, they're bouncier, maybe they flex, maybe they don't, who knows. But you look into the gold nib fountain pen market and now you're talking close to 200 bucks. And you're thinking to yourself, hoo hoo, I, I think I've earned it. I think I'm going to give it a try, right? Everybody does that. They get hooked, they get, you know, they get hooked. So they buy their first gold nib fountain pen. They try it, they love it, and now they're fixated on other gold nib pens within that price. And as they're looking into gold nib pens within that price between 180, 200, maybe 225, they try those. And then when they try those, and during the research, they discover a pen that is just so astronomically expensive, they could never conceive of the idea of them spending the money on the Grail pen. They might have come across a Homo sapien. They might have come across a Monte Grappa with gold inlays and stuff. They might have come across a pen that's upwards of 800 to to $1,000, and they're like, 
mind blown. They're like, I, I can't do that. No, I'm not going to do it. So they close their computer, their laptop, they shut it down, whatever. The next day, while they're at work, on the bus, they're thinking about it, right? They decide, you know what? I'm just curious. I'm not, I'm not going to buy it, but I'm curious to know more about the Homo sapien. Like, what makes it so special? Why is it $800? Then they look into it and they find out it's made of basaltic lava. It's made from lava from Mount Etna in a, in a villa, a 15th century villa in Florence, Italy. And you're like, okay, Florence, Italy, it's like an imported product, right? It's handmade. It's, it's, it's made of unique material. It's got that cool filling system that's like a crackhead syringe. But I, I can't buy it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, right? So they put that to rest for now. Now they're just thinking, you know what? If I can't buy myself an $850 Homo sapien, maybe I should just check out the other moderately priced $200 fountain pens with gold nibs. And then they Google more. Then they find that video that Brian Goulet made on the Semi-Flex Falcon. And you're looking at that and you're starting to research that. You try that. You spend another 250 bucks. So this process just keeps going. And finally, between 250, let's just say this person gets to their grail pen. They finally get their grail pen. They finally just, you know what? Fuck it. You know, I, I deserve it. I'm getting the grail pen, the Visconti Homo sapien, and they finally get it in their hands. They're in awe, right? The material, it's just unique. The cap has that hook lock safe mechanism. It has the little Ponte Vecchio bridge, even though it doesn't look like the bridge, but it's inspired by the bridge. It's light, it's thick, it's cool. It has a 18 karat gold nib. I love this pen. It's so awesome. I'm so glad I got it. I'm afraid to use it though. So I'm just going to put it down because I don't want to actually lose it. You know, even though I never lost a fountain pen, or maybe I'll take it to work. We'll see. We'll see, right? But we got the Grail pen. And now that we got the Grail pen, we can't justify purchasing another pen. And in between that $20 pen that you started with, all the way to the Grail pen, you might just find yourself out of reasons to buy more pens. You just, you got the one that you wanted, you got that grail pen, and now you're thinking to yourself, well, I have all these awesome pens, but is it practical for me, right? So everybody has different types of jobs. If you're a doctor, is it practical to have a fountain pen? Especially like, let's say you're an emergency room doctor, you find yourself, you're trying to use your fountain pens, you bring them to work with you, and then when you have the opportunity, you try to use them as much as possible. And you end up finding that it's not the most practical thing because it's not a click pen that you can write and then just click and put in your pocket. It's not a pen that you can just take the cap off, lose the cap like every big pen in the world, and write with it, put it down, it doesn't dry out, right? That's a big pen, but a fountain pen, for sure, you take the cap off and you leave it down for five minutes, pen's dried out. Now you got to get it running again, okay? So a lot of people may have jobs where fountain pens are impractical, but they love them. So in order to protect the pens, in order to protect that grail pen that they bought, that they finally got, that they journeyed from a $20 pen, they set their sights to an $850 pen, They've go, come through the sub-100. They've come through the 150. They come through the 225s, and they got themselves somehow to the $850 Grail pen, but they find that it's not practical for where they are. That sucks, right? They might have, they might work in construction, and I can tell you right now, if I worked in construction, this isn't going to be in my pocket while I'm using a jackhammer, right? Uh, a cop might find himself wanting to bring this pen to work, but he's not going to write a, a ticket where you have to push really hard and get through all those carbon copies with a 18 karat gold nib. But he loves writing with that pen. EMS worker, same deal. Someone in the military, right? It would only work for somebody who has an office job, someone who doesn't have a job that's physical or has a lot of elements of possible impact. For those people, great. 
they might have a lot of opportunity, but then there might also be time constraints where they got to just sign something and move or write a note and move. And wherever it is they're working, they might have shit paper. So there's a lot of obstacles in utilizing fountain pens when you're at work. And then time constraints. You might have the wish and desire to write a journal, keep a journal. You buy yourself a nice A5 size notebook to use your fountain pens in. But guess what? When you get home, you have chores to do. You have to pick up the toys and the Legos that the kids left all lying around. You have to take the dog out. You got to change the litter boxes. You got to do the dishes. You got to do the laundry. You got to do all these house chores with your wife or with your husband. And then when you're done with that, you need to spend time with your significant other or your kids. Or you need to take them to soccer. Or you need to take them to hockey or baseball or lacrosse. And then you find that you just don't have time for that journaling. So now you're not able to use it at work and you're at home and you're not able to use it at home. So I think fountain pen burnout a lot of times can come about because of impractical use scenarios. And then the last note that I had was mockery. So I found that when it comes to using fountain pens, people who don't use fountain pens, they mock you from very subtle to just outright blatant dickhead type mockery, right? I've seen stuff like, oh, is, is that one of those feather pens? Or is that one of those pens from a long time ago? Or, oh, that's some old school shit, son. All right, I mean, harmless mockery. But then it's like you get known at work as the pen guy or the pen girl. And you end up having to kind of explain yourself every single time you're seen using a fountain pen or every time you're using a fountain pen, somebody has to make a comment about it. You know, I remember I was working one day and I had to write a lot at work. And this is one of those situations where it was a great opportunity for me to use my fountain pens at work. So I'm writing in this big notebook at work. The notebook paper isn't that great. It's definitely thick, like cotton type paper. So it pulls a lot of strands off. But you know what? I'd rather write with the fountain pen than not write with the fountain pen while I'm at work. I'd rather do that than use a ballpoint pen. Now, a colleague walks up to me, knows I'm into fountain pens, knows that they are not cheap, sees me writing one day with a Pelican Souverain M400 tortoise shell and sees that I'm using that and he's like, oh, that's a nice new pen. I never seen that before. I'm like, yeah, no, I just got it. It's really nice. And the next question is, how much? Can you imagine if you see, you know, somebody and you go into their house, new house, and the first question you ask about the house is, how much? That's not polite, right? Is it polite to ask somebody about how much their clothes costs? Is it the first thing you should ask somebody when you see somebody in an outfit? Hey, that's a nice new outfit. How much? Is it polite or is it socially acceptable or appropriate to ask somebody what they paid for their new car? Is it appropriate or socially acceptable to ask what somebody paid for anything? Sometimes it's okay, but my question to you guys is, do you experience this where somebody would normally not ask you how much something you have cost you? But when it comes to fountain pens, they'll just be like, oh, you got a new pen, how much was that? And they're not asking you because they wanna know because they're interested in buying it for themselves. They're asking you because they wanna make fun of the idea that you're spending money that they would never spend on a pen. And that's what I mean by mockery. And then when you deal with that day after day after day because you work with a bunch of kids or because yeah, you work with a bunch of kids, adult kids, grown, grown human beings, that act like children, it can be tiring. So I think this list I have, like it not all inclusive, what are the causes of fountain pen burnout? It being expensive, oversaturation of market, lack of sense of accomplishment and cynicism, and where do you go after a grail pen? The time constraints, which leads to impractical use scenarios and how it could be ineffective, and mockery, I think sums up what can cause a lot of fountain pen burnout. I know that it happened to me and I'm battling with fountain pen burnout because I love fountain pens. I just find that because of what I do and where I am a lot of times and the amount of time I have at home, 
I don't have time or practical use for fountain pens. And I'm, I'm curious if anybody can relate. Am I talking out of my ass or is there anybody out there that is listening or watching this, experienced this? How did you get over it? Was it worth it for you to get over it? Or did you not get over it and move on? In which case, you wouldn't respond to this because you would have no reason to be watching this or searching out this video or have any interest whatsoever in hearing me talk about fountain pens. But my next question to everybody is, why is it important to overcome fountain pen burnout? And I have three solid reasons. And if you guys can think of any other reasons, I definitely say share it in the comments somewhere, whether it's on IG or YouTube or, or on the podcast app that you're using. Why is it important to overcome fountain pen burnout? And the first reason that I have is really important because pens are part of your personality. What does that mean? So when we use pens or when we start our fountain pen journey, the very first next thing is we become interested in the use of fountain pens, the writing experience. And that writing experience leads to more care in terms of your handwriting. I know it did for me. My handwriting looked like someone who just wrote with their butthole all the time until I got into fountain pens. Once I got into fountain pens, I started taking my time. I started being gentler as I write. I started looking at videos online of other fountain pen users and their handwriting. And I'm like, holy shit, look at these people using these fu fucking fountain pens. Their handwriting is sick, Tom being one of them. I was watching Tom's video a long time ago before he decided to start amping up his video game, his video content creation game, I don't, not actual video gaming. And it was like an hour long and it wasn't, he didn't script anything out, which is fine. He doesn't have to, but it, it was just on the cuff, on the fly. And it was an hour long and he was sampling different flex nib pens. And I was looking at his handwriting and I'm thinking, jealous, that is fucking amazing. I got to figure out how to do that myself. So from fountain pen videos, I started looking up script videos and watching videos on how to write and script different types of script, copper plate, Spencerian, never got Spencerian because that's some hard shit. But I, at least I got to a point where my cursive script looked decent. It never looked good enough for me, but it looked amazing to everybody else. And I'm proud of where I got with my script. And when I say pens are part of your personality is I discovered more things about my own self, my own personality, and my own identity in that process. I used the pens to study for exams and found <laughs> there, was a, there was kind of a pitfall there. I found that in order to study for these exams where a lot of memorization is required, I was writing out notes a lot. And then what I found was I ended up focusing more on the writing experience and how much I enjoyed it than memorizing the actual stupid shit that I was studying. But what I discovered about myself was meticulous attention to detail that I didn't know I was capable of. I also noticed that my handwriting, and every, this is for everybody, your handwriting is different than everybody else's. And when, especially when it comes to script, script is like an art. And when you start to develop your own style of script and stop trying to copy other people, you start to realize there's an identity of you in that script. So when I look at script that I wrote, I know immediately it's mine. If I look at script of somebody else that's trying to make it look like mine, I know that shit is bullshit. It's not my handwriting. So I create an identity through writing, if that makes any sense. Okay. And one of the big important reasons I think we should overcome the burnout is when you create that identity, it's part of your personality and you shouldn't separate yourself from it. Another reason is coping with stressors through writing. So I remember there was a lot of stressful times in the last several years in my life. And one of the biggest things that I resorted to was taking a notebook and just writing shit down. Between me and that page, no matter what it was, no matter how angry I was, no matter how vile and pissed off 
the stuff I was going to write, I wrote it down. I don't want anybody ever to find it and read it, but it's your opportunity to cope with stressors and be genuinely honest with yourself. There were times while I was writing in that journal, and as I'm writing, I felt ashamed of what I was writing. Nobody else is going to read it, and nobody else knows what's in my head. But I was being brutally honest with myself, about myself, about other people. And what I find is, as time went on, there were truths about what's in my head, about myself, about other people that I was discovering that I didn't really realize. I felt it here, but didn't intellectualize it in my noodle until I started writing it. So writing out your stressors, writing out how pissed off you are, how angry you are, how unfair things are, you start to actually solidify what you feel in your heart that doesn't really translate to your intellect. And then you make that tangible in front of you and you're able to cope with it. You might actually find that you're pissed off about something and then as you're writing it out, makes more sense of it and realize I'm pissed off over nothing. This is stupid. Or you might just need to ever have that feeling, get something off your chest, but you can't get it off your chest with somebody else because it might be too private. It might be too secret. It might be something that you don't want anybody to know. And then you can get it off your chest, writing it in a journal with yourself. You, have, you can burn that journal. You can get rid of the evidence if you have to. But the act of writing it out almost feels like a confession. And there's a lot of freedom, a sense of freedom that comes with being able to confess, even if it's with yourself. But if you only feel it and don't intellectualize it and put it on a piece of paper, you might not be able to experience that freedom or free yourself from anger or guilt or responsibility. So don't give up on the fountain pens, especially if you're like me. And rather than writing in a journal with a ballpoint pen, You'd rather write with a fountain pen, and if there's no fountain pen, you just won't write with one. That's something that a lot of us will do. You'll, you, you left all your fountain pens somewhere else. You have your journal. You don't want to fuck up your, your pages with ballpoint pen. I know that sounds really arrogant, but that is me. And if I'm like that, I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts other people are like that. You have your journal. You don't have your fountain pen. You're going to wait as opposed to using a fucking ballpoint pen. So coping with stressors. I don't think we're willing to cope with those stressors through writing without the fountain pen. And that's crucial in overcoming fountain pen, knowing that, that if you're giving up fountain pens, you may also more than likely give up writing with fountain pens and writing altogether. Like I said, that's what happened to me. And I'm willing to bet if it happened to me, it happened to a lot of other people who can relate. Let me know what you think. Have you experienced this? Can you relate to this? Or are you just the exact polar opposite? Everybody's different, but there's also a lot of people who are the same. And if you're disagreeing with this and think that it's all horseshit, you can tell me it's horseshit. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything and it doesn't hurt, hurt my feelings. Throw horseshit in the comments. I could care less. But I do want to know where you are or if you've ever experienced fountain pen burnout, or if it's something that you overcame. I want to hear about it. How do you use fountain pens to cope with your stressors? Does it help? For me, it certainly did. Got me through some hard times. And the last reason why it's important to overcome fountain pen burnout is it's an investment that you already made that if you don't use, it's a complete and total waste. You got your $20 pen, you got your $80 pen, you got your $180 golden nib pen, and then you finally got that homo sapien, right? But you're not going to use it. That's a lot of money. And what are you going to do if you decide, you know what, I'm burned out with fountain pens. You're going to sell them for what, a third of the price that you paid? You're going to sell them for what, half the price you paid if you're lucky? You lose a lot of money in allowing the burnout to take over. You don't just lose the money, you lose the nexus that you had to coping with stressors through writing. And you disconnect yourself 
from the part of your personality that you've identified and developed through your writing. And I feel like those are all so valuable when it comes to personal, personal identity. At least it was for me that I can't afford or want or am willing to allow fountain pen burnout to stop me from using fountain pens. Okay, now, it's easy to say, don't let it overcome you. It's easy to say, fountain pen burnout is real, don't do it. But that's not a solution. The solution is discussing how do we overcome burnout? Because we talked about what it is, we're talking about why it's important to overcome it. Now, how is it that you overcome it? If you've been experiencing this, or you think you're experiencing this, or know someone who's experiencing fountain pen burnout, I have some ideas. They have worked for me, and I think I wanna share those. They may not work for you, or you've overcome, you gotta tell me. You might have overcome fountain pen burnout and use different methods, but these are the ones that I discovered that I use, and I'm gonna share it with you. Tell me what you think. The first one is, go steady with one pen for a period of time. I didn't have a predetermined time, but I decided, you know what? Because of how chaotic my life is, because of how much moving around I'm doing, because of how much bumping into things and, and equipment that is harmful to fountain pens, I was at a point where I'm like, I'm just not gonna use one. But I didn't like putting a ballpoint pen in my pocket. Now, I'm not being a dick about ballpoints. It's, that's not what I'm doing. I know I usually am. In this case, I'm not. It's just that I felt some sort of comfort of having a fountain pen with me because I love fountain pens. And when they're with me, and I'm maybe in a situation where, let's say, things aren't safe or I have to deal with something that I don't want to deal with, Having a relic of joy with me gives me some comfort. That might be a sign of weakness or vulnerability. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. But all I can say is I had to find a pen that combats the causes of fountain pen burnout, such as impractical use scenario, right? So it would be impractical for me to take a Monte Grappa acrylic fountain pen that costs upwards to $400 with a gold nib out with me if I'm running rifles or I'm you know shooting guns, right? Or if I'm playing basketball or at the gym because any one of those activities can cause a pen to break. Running around can cause the pen to fall out of your pocket and then when it falls, it cracks and ugh, it just chips away at the acrylic it's not practical. Now, that's why I, I'm holding up this pen. This is the Karis Custom ink. It's made of solid copper, has a stainless steel Bach nib, it's cartridge converter. And this pen, you can throw out a seven story building and it won't break. It might not be as pretty, it might get scuffed up. It is what it is. But it's also a pen that patinas, it's durable, it's one of those pens that as it gets older and gets worn, it starts to look cooler and it starts to become more of your pen versus a shiny pen that looks, has to look brand new all the time. So what I did was I just went steady with this pen for several months and it felt like almost as if the pen is a companion to me. It was just part of my daily carry. I carry my wallet with me, I carry my keys with me, I carry my cell phone with me, I carry my Keras Custom ink with me at all times, everywhere I go. And I may not have time to come home. I might be exhausted when I get home and I have to take care of my cats, I gotta take care of laundry or whatever it is. I gotta jump in the shower, I gotta get to bed, and I gotta be up in six hours or five hours. I might not have time or energy to write what is in my head. But, I'll be reminded that I should because I have my fountain pen. If I didn't have my fountain pen, it would be much easier to not be reminded to write. So every once in a while, if I have a few minutes, I'll write a thought down on a piece of paper, crumple it up and throw it out. I'll write down something that really fucking pisses me off. Write it down on, on a piece of paper, crumple it, crumple it up and throw it out while I'm at home. 
but I'm able to be reminded to do that. I'm able to cope with that stressor for a moment, even if it's not in a journal, because I'm reminded, because the pen, my pen companion is with me. So going steady with one pen, you get to know that pen. That pen becomes an extension of your personality and it's constantly reminding you, hey, cope with stress, I'm here. And then you end up feeling, I guess, sentimental towards that pen. And when you're sentimental about something, it's hard to let it go, right? So after a period of time, Maybe you stop using that one pen and then you go into your collection and start dating another pen, right? Find a new connection with that pen because you might get tired of this one. You might be using this for four months and your situation changes, something changes and you want to try something else because we're trying to keep the pen thing going. Not because the hobby, not because you owe it to anybody else, but because the hobby has become such a deep rooted part of your personality on a personal, intimate level because of how it affected your handwriting, how it affected your communication with yourself, how it affected communication with your significant other. Like for example, I used to, and I wish I, I wish I do this more, and I'm going to. I used to write letters to her every single morning because every single morning I walk out the door, I think to myself, if I don't come home, I need to leave her with something. I feel like I do that less now because I'm, for several reasons, because I'm very busy, I'm tired, and also because I'm on YouTube and podcasts. And if tomorrow I walk out into the street and I get run over by a bus and a three-wheeler, you know, a four-wheeler four or whatever, she, she can see me whenever she wants. She just has to log on and watch it. I want to do that more. I got to get back into doing that. And... The reason why I did it was that it wasn't just because I wanted to find an excuse to write my write with my pens. I can do that with anything. I can use my fountain pens for drawing, which is another way to overcome burnout, believe it or not, using pens for more than just writing, but using it for drawing and inking. I found myself using fountain pens to ink my sketches. I used to draw back in last year a lot of comic book art. I interviewed Chris Lee. He's a Marvel Comics artist. And I wanted to ink my pencils with fountain pens because the fountain pens were an integral part of things that I love. I've developed pers personal identifiers of my personality through fountain pens and I didn't want to give it up. And I didn't want to switch to a felt tip pen. I didn't want to switch to you know, those dip pens with Indian ink and stuff like that. I wanted to use fountain pens and they worked and it was just fine, it was great. And I found that that kept me at home with fountain pens. Not literally at home, but it kept me grounded with my fountain pens. Another thing that I noticed was part of the burnout was you could just get tired of your own handwriting, right? So you've practiced script, you've practiced cursive, you develop your own style, and now you're trapped in that style. You can't break out of it, and you're just bored with the way you write, Maybe it's not Spenseri enough. Maybe it's not Copperplate enough. Maybe you just got bored with it and you don't like the way your handwriting looks anymore, but you don't know how to write any other way. That's exactly what happened to me. I got tired of my own cursive. I got tired of my own script. It doesn't look so nice like, like Vanessa Langton when she writes. She writes, it's like, it's like heaven in a fucking pen. Tom Otto, the odd oink, when he writes, his style is distinct. I can't copy his style. I'm not going to try because if I try, it's just going to look like an ugly version of his handwriting and it's not going to be my, I, my handwriting. So I changed up my writing style. How? I started exploring print. So instead of writing in cursive, I'm printing a lot and I'm discovering frustrating obstacles when I write E's, right? So you know how a lot of people, they write the E, lowercase E, they do the horizontal line, and then they at the end of the horizontal line, they come around with the rest of the E, right? The crescent of the E. I always notice when I do the horizontal line, it's a slope into the E, and then sometimes it's a clean break into the slope. Does you guys know what I'm talking about? But basically, my E's are inconsistent. Pretty much all my alphabet, when it comes to print, is inconsistent. So what I'm doing is I'm slowing down with print. 
I'm trying to write print so it's noteworthy and just looks good. The more I try, it's like learning a musical instrument. I'm finding that it, you got to practice it. I'm finding it's frustrating. I'm finding what some days I love the way my print looks. I'm like, I'll write. And I'll be like, oh, this, this print looks fucking fantastic. And then the next day I'll look at it and be like, that shit's disgusting. I got to try again. But it's almost like I need goals, right? If we become stagnant, we get tired of stuff. We get bored with it. We don't want to continue with it. So we have to do something that challenges us. And I think the challenge for me now is going from cursive and script and switching over to printing. A lot of people nowadays don't use cursive, and it's a sad thing. They don't teach it in schools as much. I think practically anymore, they're using print. And for that reason, I used to be so resistant against print because they're not teaching it at school and it's a dying art. However, I honestly think that even though I'm tired of my own script and I don't like it anymore, I'm at a point where if I had to switch back to script, it's like riding a bike. I might have to dust off the bike, sure, but when I go back to the script, it's a skill that I'll have. But like any skill, it's perishable, so might need some practice to get back into it. Now this one, the next way to overcome fountain pen burnout, and this one is really like, a, what are those bouncy castles that the kids jump in, right? You're in the air, you hit the, the bouncy castle surface, and then you bounce straight up, right? Or a trampoline. It's like a trampoline, this one. Revert to ballpoint pens and disposables. Makes me feel like I'm abandoning a part of my identity and makes me feel yucky when I write with ballpoint pens. So this happened to me. I was at work. I didn't bring a fountain pen. I was being inconsistent with my fountain pens and I just picked up a ballpoint pen and started writing with it and hated every moment of it and then realized later I had lost it. If that were a fountain pen, definitely wouldn't have hated the writing experience and definitely wouldn't have lost it. And then I'm thinking to myself, after using the ballpoint pen shit, I need a fountain pen here. I don't care what kind of fountain pen it is, but I need a fountain pen here. And then I made sure that I went home and picked a fountain pen that's going to be with me as an everyday carry no matter what. And that's how I got into the whole going steady with one pen for some time. I actually was without a fountain pen and realized the impact that it had. Now that might not be the case for you, but if you're doing occasional and casual writing like I do, it had an effect on me. And like I said, it might not happen. It might not be for you, but try it. So how does one overcome fountain pen burnout? I'm going to list it again. Go steady with one fountain pen for a period of time. And that period of time is subjective. For me, it's been months. For you, it might be weeks at a time. For you, it might be a schedule. Like how would you go steady with a fountain pen and get to know your fountain pens better, right? Because a lot of times we buy pens over the course of a year more than we use them. We'll ink it up, use it, and love it, put it down, move on to the next one, and that pen now doesn't have any use. And you forget about it, or you forget that you wanted it, forget that you have it, and forget that you liked it. So what would your schedule be? Like, how would you go about going steady with a pen, and for what period of time? And the other thing was change up the writing style, give it a shot. You might hate print, or you might hate cursive, but challenge yourself because when you have challenges, right, you want to find a tool that helps you overcome that challenge and you might find a pen that you didn't think you would love but love it because it's the perfect tool, it's the perfect weapon to overcome the obstacle and challenge of changing up your writing style. If you're doing cursive, try print. If you're doing print, try cursive. Challenge yourself. Give yourself goals. It motivates you to use your pens, right? And then use pens for more than just writing. If you like to draw, that one's not so much a priority, but use it for drawing, use it for inking, doodle with it, do things other than just write. It, it could help. And lastly, again, revert to ballpoint pens and disposables. I really feel like that'll definitely do it for you. It definitely did it for me. So this is kind of like my off the cuff. I, I made some bullet no notes 
off the cup cuff discussion on what is fountain pen burnout because as every hobby exists out there it happens in the fish keeping hobby people get all excited about keeping fish tanks they end up getting five six tanks they become overwhelmed with it and then they decide you know what i'm burnt out from it the problem with that is if you get burnt out you're you're killing fish you're killing lives so there's a little bit more, it's, I mean, I wouldn't say more, but there's a lot at stake. You get burnt out in fish keeping, you're killing off living creatures. So you really got to find a way to overcome that if you're a fish keeper and you're getting burned out. With fountain pens, I think it's more interpersonal. I think it's more intimate. And I think overcoming the burnout is because is important because you have to overcome abandoning a part of yourself. And... I understand the market is saturated. There are so many options of fountain pens out there. You get to a point where you're like, I just bought a pen from that brand and now they're coming up with a new version with a, an iterative improvement that I wish mine had. I'll buy that one. And then a month later they come out with a new color and you're like, I like that color. And you just can't stop, right? And then eventually you get burnt out because you get frustrated with the onslaught. If you take a look at Sega, do you guys remember Sega, the gaming company? They were savage successful with the Sega Genesis, but they didn't stop there, right? They, they took Felix the Cat and they took Mickey Mouse and made Sonic the Hedgehog. That's actually how Sonic the Hedgehog came out. They were successful with the Sega Genesis, but they got greedy. And then they started releasing the 32X. Then they released the Sega CD, then the Sega Saturn. What they did was they oversaturated the market, their own market. People didn't know what to buy because if they bought one, they have to buy an attachment. Then a game would come out for the Saturn, but it's not on, and, and a different game would come out for the 32X. And then another game would come out for the Genesis. And now you're taking a customer who loved the Genesis and, but wants to play the Saturn game, wants to play that Sonic game because they love Sonic, they love the Genesis, and they want to play Sonic the Hedgehog on the other platforms. But now they got to buy a $300 system and the game they became oversaturated and they're like, just fuck this. They went with Super Nintendo, right? So I think historically, financially, Super Nintendo beat out Sonic the Hedgehog because of that reason. So eventually Sega started going downhill, right? They tried to, they tried to like gear up and come out with the next console. I think the console after the Sega Genesis was, after the Sega Genesis, Sega Saturn, Sega CD and 32X was the Dreamcast. But the reputation of Sega at that time kind of went downhill it was the it was like game developers were having a hard time dealing with their proprietary gd roms because sega didn't want to use cds they didn't want to use standard cds and dvds and they ended up proprietizing their disc and it made it hard for game developers to make games so even though the sega dreamcast was awesome it wasn't standard enough for programmers and the Sega Dreamcast kind of failed because of that. And then PlayStation 2 came along and just whooped its ass. So that's what comes of oversaturation of the market. It causes people to burn out because too many options. If you think about comic books in the 90s, I remember when Image Comics came out. They started off with six creators with six different titles, and all of those titles were successful. Then they started coming out with these spin-off titles and eventually Marvel did the same thing they started spinning off their characters and making titles by the time 1999 came around I think it's 1999 there were so many different titles that people just became overwhelmed and then stopped that's something that happens in the gaming world that's something that happens in every industry the comic book industry and I'm afraid that it might happen in the fountain pen industry there are so many options out there so many different price points. It gets overwhelming for the consumer. It gets to a point where they have to study too much to make an informed decision. They have to wade through thousands of different pens to find the pen that they want. And what ends up happening is people are like, you know what, I don't have time right now. I'll do it later. But they don't get to it because they're busy, right? Because the real world is fast-paced, it's harsh, and if they slow down in life, they get left behind. But in they have to put something off to the side and save it for later. And, and it could be fountain pens when there are too many options, right? And I noticed that that happens to, that happened to some friends of mine 
what they do is they shut down. Instead of looking into pens or trying something or looking into different new styles that came out for a few minutes, they have to invest an hour. And then it gets to a point where they don't have that hour. So they're just like, you know what? I'm actually not going to look for anything. I'm just going to stick to what I have. And then these other, these other things come into play. They don't have time to do writing. It's impractical for their job. Or maybe, like I said, they got their grail pen and it could have disappointed them, right? I think a lot of people who have the Visconti Homo sapiens experience this, they spend $850 and for some reason their Pilot Metropolitan that was 20 bucks writes better. And they had an expectation that their $800 pen should be the best writer in the world, but it's not. And that's another aspect of fountain pen burnout that could really affect somebody, which is why I think going steady with a pen can help that. Like if you tune that pen or you get to know that pen or you fix it yourself or whatever you got to do, get it warrantied, and then you use it regularly, you get used to it, and then you can fall in love with it, and then it can keep you drawn into the fountain pen hobby. But... I think the fountain pen virus is very real. I also think fountain pen burnout is real because I've experienced both. I've gotten other people infected with the fountain pen virus and I've seen them burn out. And it's not a hobby that I want to see go away. The sol a, a huge solution would be to, I think, desaturate the market and slow down with all of the thousands of options that can overwhelm somebody but people aren't going to do that. As, as long as people are out there buying them, they're going to keep putting out new stuff, new stuff over and over and over and until it hits that Sega plateau or until it hits that you know 1990s comic book bloom where it becomes overwhelming and no one can invest time or money into it anymore. I hope that doesn't happen. Do you think that, for anybody listening, do you think that, we're headed in that direction? Am I just being cynical, right? Because that's also a symptom of burnout, cynicism. Am I being cynical? Do you agree that we're headed in that direction where fountain pens are becoming such, they're just becoming such a large market where it's becoming oversaturated that it might cause burnout, it might cause people to just move away from it because there's so many options they don't know what to pick from? If I'm just being cynical, I wouldn't mind you telling me, dude, shut up. You're just being cynical. Or if you agree with me, I want to know. I want to know your opinion because the fountain pen hobby, the fountain pen community, and the fountain pen industry is important to me. I don't know. Maybe it's just because everything going on in the world, it's taken a toll on my outlook. If that's the case, and from your perspective, there's – did you see that thing just fly by? That was weird. If that's the case, and from your perspective, nothing is, nothing is going wrong, tell me, right? I might just have to take a breath, go on vacation, meditate, breathe. Who knows? It might just be me. And I wouldn't mind you telling me in the comments below. It's a discussion. You can disagree with me. It won't hurt my feelings. You can argue with me and tell me I'm completely wrong, and I'll think about it. I could be very well wrong. I'm open to discussing it. But I think that the discussion needs to be had because it's, there's going to be other people out there that think like I do. And if they're wrong and I'm wrong, great. But if we're right, we should know about it, right? We should prepare for it somehow. I don't know. You tell me. But anyway, that's what was going on in this little pea brain that I have. And I was just wanting to talk about it. I hope you guys can engage with me because... It's important. I think it's an important discussion. It might be a little serious. I might seem a little annoyed and agitated about it. I'm not. I really want people to identify fountain pen burnout if they have it. And I want to give them ways to get over it and overcome it. But first, you have to identify it and understand why it's important to overcome it. So anyway, that was my spiel. Thanks again for listening. This was episode number 191 of the Penboy Roy Pentertainment Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Love you guys. Be well. Be safe.